All right, guys, I've noticed a lot of comments on my videos about wanting more designs for pretender choices, more options, and more blessed choices, all sorts of different options. And I responded to one commenter telling them that I would respond with a video about pretender creation, how I do things, what method I use to create a pretender. And admittedly, it's not super rigorous every time. I do it differently in different ways for virtually every game. But my line of thinking is essentially always the same style. I'm not the kind of person who thinks that there's one pretender choice choice for a nation that is the best. I don't think there's one setup for a nation that's the best. And the way I can best give an example of this, just a really quick example, is late age, if you look at a nation that's fairly well known, and yes, I'm using a fairly well known nation for a reason, on late age, if you look, they're really, really well known for this particular spell here, Sanguine Heritage, where you're basically bringing one of the noble vampire lords to come in to get you jump started into blood magic for an insanely cheap price. I think the normal blood Blood magic, where is it? The uh, Curse of Blood is 96. It's insanely expensive. It's more than double, but you get it at level zero for only 44. So you can get jump started into blood. So Ulm, the quote unquote standard method of playing Ulm is to obsess on your vampire lords and get heavy, heavy, heavy into blood, having immortal vampire lords and immortal vampires running around in massive little armies and destroying people through elfing and various things. However, I am of the belief that you can look at this nation strengths you say okay we got we have good death gem generation glamour gem and astral pearl generation we have wolf herds who give us good patrollers so that obviously pushes us towards blood magic but we also have these black templars who are insanely powerful even in the late age these are pretty insane stats that's one higher than normal interesting if you look at these guys you could actually build a blessed strategy around these guys instead of a huge blood magic strategy these fortune tellers wouldn't be affected by the blessed but the hochmeisters would and the black priests would these look very similar to our middle age Ulm priests. I don't know why they didn't put armor on in the late age. But if you look around, you can see there's barely any strategies for bless here. However, if you really wanted to push this, these guys are only recruited in the capital. So instead of doing a bless, this is what I would think. If I wanted to do a bless strategy, why would you do a heavy bless strategy on a nation that can only produce blessed troops from its capital? The primary, well, you can summon some, but the primary reason you would do that is if you want to rush somebody down, rush somebody down near you. So that's why I say I don't really choose my pretender based on what's best for the nation. Obviously, what is meta or what is likely the best choice for this nation is something that empowers their blood magic even more and can cast some of the high level blood magic spells that'll really jump you into some disgusting spells. But you could very easily hop into this nation and say, nah, I want to rush somebody down to get myself early power to expand my nation. I don't like the fact that my nation's trapped into blood, trapped into having a poor economy because blood's ridiculously expensive monetarily. Instead, I want to focus on research, get a ton of mages and doing say maybe sabbaths or communions and ooh, you could do some complicated stuff with sabbaths communions and having both in the same battle since they would be different pathways now that they're separated in dominion six so you could do something like that theoretically and if you did that always hit tab here so you can see all of the quick hand if you were going to do something sacred right look what these guys require to build 72 resources do you have any of those commanders that give you bonus resources nope we don't get a forge bonus from our commanders like we do in middle age Ulm. So we're not going to get a forge bonus from any commanders. So we need to really take something that have, now granted we have the fort produces 25% more resources, which helps, but we really need to emphasize the productivity. It would even behoove you if you really wanted to get max production in your home province to take somebody like this, that would give you a plus one to your maximum resources because, or productivity, because then you could get 45 instead of 30. That 15% is a big number. So that would be one consideration. If you really were afraid you wouldn't be able to produce produce, you know, 10 of your knights in your home province. The next consideration is you want your dominion to be very high. You really don't want, that's a perfect number. You really don't want your dominion to be so low that you can't recruit that many commanders. Cause everybody always says, Oh, just build five temples. Well, I play a lot of multiplayer and let me tell you, building more than five temples is very brutal in most multiplayer games because you know what I'm going to do as your opponent? I'm going to target every province you have that has an unforded temple. I'm going to destroy that temple to cost you 400 gold. That's the easiest murder of a quote unquote mage level cost that I've ever seen. Just send in a little scout. Oh, you have six province defense. Well, I can send in a little raiding party and take it out and then just vanish the next turn. There's not much you can do to protect that many temples. So if you're considering a temple strategy where in this build you take, let's say four 
dominion or five dominion and then you plan on just building 10 temple strength to get to seven don't think that's reasonable because it's really not you people are, you have to be holding on to a minimum of 10 provinces but not really right because your cap circle you're hoping to have four or five provinces in your capsule circle you're not going to want to build temples around there unless you could fort them right so if you build temples in your cap circle people can just raid your cap circle and take those temples away when you're not looking but if you build them only where you have forts that's now six provinces you can't build in your home province and the five surrounding your home province so now you have to have 16 to be able to build 10 temples and that's assuming you fort every single province that becomes ridiculously expensive so when you're looking at this dominion score even though in dominion six it seems a little less important to have super high dominion score if you're doing a cap only sacred you would really need to take that into account and say hmm at most i'm going to be producing 10 of these per turn what can other people produce per turn in 50 forts right do you think 10 of these can be buffed enough that they can take on 50 giants if somebody has you know in late age giants may not be a thing but let's say somebody has unlimited horde spam of undead maybe if you took fire shield on these guys you could maybe assuming they survive but that's a big maybe you'd also have to take reinvigoration you'd also have to take something else to make sure that you were able to maximize what you were doing if you're not going to be able to then you're probably going to have an issue because you really need to just make sure that your plan for your pretender works for you and your play style i am very happy in a blitz if i know what nations are in the blitz to rush somebody down with an early pretender choice and a sacred rush i would do something these guys already do 19 and 19 but remember we're in the age where 23 protection is not unheard of so these guys still do decent damage because this is a heavy lance so heavy lances do full strength bonus so this thing's doing 32 damage on its first hit they can punch through quite a bit so what i would look at is the worrying encumbrance and i would focus on reducing that a little bit right so let's pretend we went with the what is this do i of farming so let's pretend we did this guy just for the productivity or let's see if there's a better productivity option around here somewhere oh there we go forge lord well you know what let's see what bless effects we get from water and earth also you hit b to see all bless effects and you hit s to see all spells during this so b let's look at this let's see what water we could get we could get quickness that would certainly be good with our three attacks on our knights but remember we wanted to make ourselves a little more protected right if we have knights that we can only make 10 per turn of keeping them alive would be really good in general to boost their general stats you could do something like a heroism bless with a bunch of resistances so instead of worrying about the productivity so much let's find ourselves a good generalized bless vampire queen frost father let's take a look at this guy let's say that was what we were going for just to get us back to that nice even 40 so we have 11 bless points let's just take the basics let's do fire resist let's say we want shock resist let's say we want a little cold resist to make ourselves resistant to the auras that people are likely to take do a little reinvigoration nothing wrong with that where's the poison resist you know we need it there it is poison resist or you can take strong blood which i really like i'm sorry uh enchanted blood and strong blood are both fairly new this one gives you a little bit of hp regen i think that's a good one to take and strong blood for poison poison resist and disease resist would be very good. So let's ramp these up just a little bit, give ourselves extra bless points. Probably have to go dormant, but we're doing a rainbow strategy, so that works. So we've got all of our resists. Instead of poison resist, let's instead take strong blood, give ourselves an extra blood to be able to get enchanted blood. Now, here's one thing that I would compare. Enchanted blood for a little bit of regen and magic resist versus blood surge. Ordinarily, you would want blood surge for the reinvigoration. I think that's a good point to take, but for four points, regen, you would be surprised how much this regen actually actually helps human health troops get back and magic resistance can sometimes dictate a battle. So let's check out our magic resist, see how valuable that point is to us. Ooh, that's a very valuable point because it's not only gonna give it to our knight, but it's also gonna give it to our mount, which is gonna give us seven magic resist, which is quite a big difference. If you put anti-magic on a black destrie, it's going to be, you know, 10, which is just normal. But now if we put it on a seven magic resist, it goes up to 11, that could actually be important. So let's prioritize the magic resist here because we really wanna keep our guys protected in chance blood now we still have six points left we have decent resistances to virtually everything right poison resist disease resist we have everything that would annoyingly take these troops out now remember all we've done is made them more durable to a small degree right what else is their downsides well they only have 15 hit points and the horse only has 24 right good protection low defense don't worry about defense you're going to be outnumbered in almost every fight what else could we do to give ourselves a little bit more protection in the late age you don't have to worry as much about magic right you have to worry about troops remember our encumbrance is six and our horse encumbrance is sick our guys are going to get exhausted we have one reinvigoration what's another way we can get reinvigoration remember we were just talking about it we could spend two points to get another reinvigoration but let's compare that to blood surge four points for one reinvigoration three attack three strength one defense versus four points for two reinvigoration i would say in that trade one reinvigoration with attack strength and defense would be a better choice so i would select that because your knights are going
going to hit with that lance, get blood surge and immediately become more fatigue resistant. And now one that has lost popularity since they nerfed it, but I hate to break it to you guys. It's still really good. Heroism. Take heroism twice. These guys now understand this comparison. We have the choice here. Two heroism, one more reinvigoration. What does heroism give us? Strength, attack skill, defense skill. Eventually, I think reinvigoration, some HP gives us basically all the stats we really want. What does reinvigoration give us? Just flat reinvigoration. The difference is though, if you're against somebody who can spam weak troops early, early game before you've had a chance for your heroism to catch up, reinvigoration will outperform heroism. Hell, strength will outperform heroism, but any of these two point blesses will outperform it. The trick with heroism is it needs time to settle. So if your knights are dying, if you're playing bad battles and you're getting slaughtered, you're really going to be punished for this. That's the next thing I would check. I would make sure we can afford imprisoned because if our highest blood mage is level two or level one, that's going to be a problem to get our blood magic started. Why? Because I'm looking at our spell here. We require three blood and three death. That's going to be impossible to get jump started if we really want to get heavy into blood. So now you can tell if we choose this rainbow mage and we choose this aggressive buildup, we're not going to be able to do everything. We're not going to also be able to leap early into blood. Sure, our pretender will easily be able to cast that spell once he's around. And my line of thinking with this particular build, this is not the line of thinking I would have with late age Ulm. Believe me, I've played them plenty and I love obsessing with their blood and murdering people with vampires. But in this particular case, we have a guy, you have to think of the storyline of the game, right? If you can survive until year three, that's usually a good thing with a late game build, right? That depends on your god coming out building vampires. You should already have an extremely well-established blood economy by late age if you plan on going that route. But this gives you a little versatility. You have super tanky resistant knights that are very difficult to deal with. They can't be dealt with with an aura. They can't be dealt with with, you know, just real small damage lightning stuff because the primary thing about lightning bolt and all that is when they hit you, they stun you. If you have shock resist, you resist the stun. Cold resist, the auras. Reinvigoration helps keeping them going. Blood surge helps keeping them going. Enchanted blood keeps them going health wise. They're very tough and tanky. They have a really good shot at staying alive. Now that you have a really good shot of staying alive and getting stronger over time, now you have a chance of building up actual forces with them. So what would we want? Well, let's see how many Dominion points we can take because remember I told you we need to be able to recruit enough troops. So let's say we take an extra point in death because we really want to emphasize death and blood with our vampire mages. I wouldn't do this personally. I would do something like this. It enables, you know, Mother Oak and other things or maybe this, but I would not regularly do this, but maybe do this to make sure our mage is a little more defensive against mind hunting. Yeah, let's do that. Now we have one more bless point. We can capitalize on that heroism once again to make it even better, but now we need to lose a scale down here. Well, what's a scale we can afford to lose? Well, we don't mind a little bit of heat, right? Generally for knights, because then it doesn't reduce our move speed with our knights. Your map move goes down in the heat or in the cold if it's snowing. I believe it makes it so every province costs one extra move point to move through. So it really limits a lot of the advantages of knights and their fast move speed. So if you're having to make this decision, you might not want to go through and take cold, right? Because that would slow even your own knights down. However, if you're planning on doing vampires and blood late, you might love cold, right? Because undead hate fire. So I would kind of avoid the heat change here. What I would do is probably take a little bit of poor luck because when it comes to our mages, we don't want to take poor magic since our research is so low. We have really low research mages on this nation. So we would in fact probably want to focus on magic boosting. But remember our knight's weakness is magic resistance. So nothing higher than that. And maybe take two bad luck. I would maybe consider one heat just because we're being forced into it for the cost and then balance that out with one order to kind of counteract this. So that's sort of how I did. But remember, the approach to this particular chassis was I want to create myself an early game rush for late age Ulm that can score me extra gem income by murdering somebody else and taking their capital. That's what these knights would do. So then once you've done that, these knights would beat them in the field. How do you siege castles? Well, now you have to go through and you have to look, hmm, where do I get my siege strength? One siege strength, 1.2. What are these guys siege strength? 1.7. You don't have anybody with super siege strength, right? So now we have to start looking around for special modifiers, see if anybody has any siege strength additions. So we really don't have a way to siege anybody very effectively, right? So we have to keep that in mind when we're building this. Also, I'm trying to show you guys a non-optimal setup so you know that not everything works. And the funny thing is everybody says, yeah, but an optimal setup will beat you. No, no, no. I have seen so many people build the perfect pretender for a nation only to get absolutely destroyed by somebody like me who built a pretender specifically designed to win that exact game. I have literally 
seen a high level Abyssia player get beaten by somebody who took 20 fire resistance on their bless and just annihilated them because they hadn't planned on using anything other than fire in the first year and Abyssia got annihilated and wiped out and rushed. Abyssia with a hell bless got annihilated because their hell bless involved a fire shield and basically making them more protection tanky and they just got stomped. Believe me, if you aren't flexible with multiple pretender choices and doing something like this that's a little unorthodox, you won't surprise anybody and if you don't surprise anybody, guess what? They probably have a plan for you. And if they don't have a plan for you, they can find a YouTube channel like mine or Lucid's or somebody else's that does have a plan for you. Because if you're an Abyssian and you just come through with fire and you just plan on doing fire, 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 fire until fire runs off and then switching over to blood, 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 everybody has seen that a hundred times. But if you play late age Ulm and nobody sees vampires, but they're preparing all these undead counters and they're preparing magic pen items for undead counters and they're planning on banishing you and having specific anti-undead spells like soul slay to remove the undead so they can't be returning with their immortal power. And then you come at them with a whole bunch of knights that are super resistant and just absolutely stomping their armies and lighting them up. And then you start raiding their base because you can take an army of four knights and take out a province defense of six with literally zero problem. Heck, you could probably do it with a commander all by himself with an item, Ross brand or something. So if you really, really do look at the game you're in, if you're in a blitz or if you're in a game with friends or if you're in a multiplayer game where you all agree on nations, you guys have little rules like nobody plays water unless two people are playing water, similar common multiplayer rules. You can really turn this into a specific build to kill people. For example, let's say we're in a four player game with Femini, Raga, and Marignan, and they all have fire damage. You know Marignan has lots of fire damage. Raga, hell, let's throw Abyssia in there. You're going to have a lot of fire damage running around, right? This is an extreme example. But if you did that, you could take our little pretender down here and you could take away, let's say, cold resistance and jack up the fire resistance because they may hit you with shock. They may hit you with fire, but they're definitely not going to hit you with cold if their troops are vulnerable to it, right? Raga might do a weird cold approach, but I've not seen a Raga do it yet. But imagine that. Imagine if you played Raga and you made a cold build, something built around their cold units instead of their Zayedans. That's how I approach pretender creation. I approach every pretender creation in every game as how can I beat the specific players that are here? That's how I do it. And I don't let my nation dictate what I do. Now, there are some times when I go in and I say, hmm, I'm in a large game with 12 players. I'm not sure who's near me. It's a randomly ma generated map. Let me pick something that's good virtually against everything, right? You pick something like Marignan. These knights can be recruited everywhere. So a strong sacred bless would be really important. That would be something good to do. Come in here to Marignan. You say, hmm, let's pick a very obvious, basic Baphomet. This is what people are looking for, right? Is the easy selection where it's like, oh, always pick this. It'll be good against everybody. Everybody, you you can handle everything. Let me show you exactly why that doesn't work. Say I pick the Baphomet, which I see all the time. Let's give it some points. Let's make him dormant. He's immobile, so you don't really need him early anyway. Let's pick Blood Surge to help out the knights. Let's pick some Fire Resistance. Pick Enchanted Blood, Magic Weapons. That way we'll have Magic Weapons, Fire Resistance, Enchanted Blood, and Blood Surge on these absolute monsters that can be built in any castle later on. And they'll be very strong, very difficult to deal with. Plenty of points to play with. We can do that. That'll give us four points to play with. We can go a little heat because we like the heat. Little growth, little bit of productivity, little order, reduce luck to balance order. I like to do that to get some points back. Massive order. Let's see if we want magic. Big researchers, but see how this guy takes two turns to recruit. We're not going to look at him as a research mage, so I think he's irrelevant when it comes to research. So, And these guys are the greatest researchers of all time. They don't research at all, and that's how I think research should be done. Sorry, my middle-aged Ulm is showing, but what we want to do is we want to make sure we don't have any super high research mages, like 13, 14 points. Maybe even like this 11 guy is a pretty good research mage, and you're going to be spamming witch hunters on Marignan for the most part. So since you have these guys, you could play theoretically where you reduce their research. I don't think it would be a big advantage. What's our magic resist? 12. We have room to play with lowering our own magic resist. And don't forget our flagellants also take our bless. So our bless would be really nice if a couple flagellants start hitting people with blood surge and magic weapons. They're going to be hurting some people. So we have two more. Let's take another growth to max out our late game growth. And let's take plus one magic. That'll give us a good, strong basis for knights. This is one of those things that I would take in a generic game where I think, hmm, I have heat, so I'd take fire resist over anything else. Plus my paths gave me fire resist. I have heat in my dominion, so fire is going to be more dangerous because if you guys don't know the formula for putting out a fire on yourself, it's based on the dominion heat that you're in currently. So now we also resist extra heat, so our troops get less fatigue from the heat, which encumbrance is always a factor for knights. We get blood surge for a little reinvig and some damage, enchanted blood to get our HP back, protect ourselves a little more, and magic weapons to make it so not only our flagellants, but also 
our Knights of the Chalice can take out anybody that has Ethereal as a Bless or anything like that. So now we have a good generic overall build. And sadly, most people are going to come away from this video going, oh, finally, he gave me a generic build I can use in every game. I'm telling you guys, this is not how to do it. Let's go back in and show you a big difference in Marignan, how I would actually build myself for a game. All right, so the way I would look at a game, let's say our Marignan game, we are against Ulm, who we know is going to beat us with steel. Let's say we're against Agartha, who's going to fatigue us with Curse of Stones and is going to beat us to death with a bunch of statues, possibly lightning. We know we're against Pythium, has a bunch of poison involved. We also know we're against Ermor, which everyone's gonna team up on and murder, so we don't have to worry too much about them. And we're against Shinoyama. So we have somebody who has a lot of death magic and a lot of power in spell cast. We are in a big game with a lot of nations, but one thing we have to remember is we are going to get beat down by people with higher protection than us. We're going to get fatigued by people who have Curse of Stones that they can spam every single battle annoyingly. We have more fatigue where Ermor is going to beat us with undead hordes. We have things like, I forget who else I said was in this imaginary game. You know, let's say Ind is in here, which is a generic human nation. Now, if I was facing all of these guys and I knew fatigue was going to be a big issue, here's what I would do is I would say, okay, the way I can be more versatile. Look at my mages. I have astral, fire, and possibly air and earth. That means with my communion setups, I could theoretically wait until I pull an earth random, an air random, and a fire. I'm always going to have a good fire caster. I could now have a communion with fire. I have a communion with air. I have a communion with astral, and I have a communion with earth. So all of those spells are at my disposal. I can be super, super flexible with those spells, right? So if I come in here, let's say I come in here and just look at astral buffs, body ethereal. This this is area of effect one. We can give this to our troops. If they don't have magic weapons, we can cause a serious problem for them. Doom. We can dump doom on people and curse them every single battle, which is basically the same as getting that super expensive fate weaving bless, right? Instead of paying for the bless, we just cast doom when we need it. It's not the same, but you understand what I mean. We can look at earth spells. We can do legions of steel for the entire battlefield to give ourselves more armor to keep up with somebody like Ulm. Not necessarily beat them, but keep up with them. But now you can start thinking, I'm going to cut through Ulm with earth. So now I know I want a mage focused bless, right? And there's no downside to it. I know that in my troops, I have heavy armor, right? But look at these guys, 21 and 16, 18 and 15. These guys require less investment. They're a little more vulnerable to magic resist. I think they're 10 versus 12, but they do 17, 17 and 15. And these guys do 18, 18 and 15. So it's literally one point of damage. Now the attack rolls are one point higher as well. But if you focused a bless around those guys, it would cost you something every time you bought somebody else. If you focus on these guys instead, now you can instead focus on these guys, these guys, these guys without the relative cost going higher. Now we're talking about a strategy where we have these guys running around, a bunch of man at arms who have kite shields to protect them from arrows, and then we could throw a ton of crossbowmen out there who we give a little spell I like to call Hail of Burning Embers to give them all fire damage. This is nice. Now it's not going to affect somebody with super heavy armor, but it is going to light a lot of people on fire that don't have it. So we have a lot more flexibility. So I would pick a mage bless, a mage setup. And now that I know I pick a mage setup, I look at my troops, high resources, lower recruitment points, but you know, knights are hard to tell. Higher resources than recruitment points, higher resources than recruitment points, higher resources by far than recruitment points, higher resources than recruitment by far, by far. So now we know. So what I would do is I would find a ratio. These guys are even, 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 even. These guys are like a three to two ratio, something like that. So then what I would do is I would look at this as I want something like this setup. And if I could get this to three and this to two, that would be ideal. So let's look and see if we have anybody with a productivity bent. This gentleman, the Dewey of Farming from earlier, this guy, the Titan of Forethought, if we want to pay crazy amounts, we have the Forge Lord, or I guess he's called Titan of the Forge now. We also have Eldest Cyclops, which is basically, he could be an option if we really wanted that productivity. Although I'll give you a spoiler alert, since we're not trapped in our cap only, we don't need to worry about this nearly as much. I think two and one is perfectly fine because we can just have three or four castles pumping out all these knights. We want a little heat because we like the fire, maybe even two heat if we really wanted it. I wouldn't do that much, but one heat's good. Then you just don't fight in the summer, you fight in the winter and you're perfectly balanced. Get a little growth to emphasize money. Let's go neutral luck and then go with magic buff. A few points to play with here. There we go. Bring it up to eight, maybe seven. Let's play with this a little bit and see what we can get. If we can get something rounded off. There we go. Now, if we take four points away from our scales, we're good. Or we can do dormant and then we can bring one of these down. Yeah. 
that feels good. Three Earth, six Astral. That gives us the capability of casting massive Astral spells, even though I chose the wrong statue. Doesn't really matter. But let's just pretend we chose this statue as our Mage Bless, right? What kind of stuff can we get for our Mage Bless? Arcane Finesse for Penetrate Magic, Enemy Resistance. Well, remember, we're going to be doing Astral, Air, and Fire, and Earth, right? So if you look at where's our Witch Hunters, we're going to be doing a lot of Fire and Astral, a lot of Fire and Astral, but also Earth and Air. So Earth, Air, and Astral, I mean, Earth, Air, and Fire don't really want too much magic penetration, but Astral really does. So now we would dictate, hmm, which one do we want to focus on? Well, the easy way to go is to, this is the easiest Mage Bless you can ever take, right? This helps your Knights, keeps them going a little longer. This helps your Mages. This helps virtually everybody. Far Caster, that is a huge buff. Now, if you don't pick up some precision on this buff, your Far Caster is going to suck because your Mages are going to whiff because the precision penalties for long range casting really hurt Mages. All right, sorry guys, coming in here later in the same day because I realized I had essentially chosen how to build my god for Marignan without actually choosing the chassis. So let me kind of walk you through how I would choose the chassis. We know we want roughly seven or eight dominion score. We don't really care. We just like pushing our dominion with high dominion. And we know we're going for a mage bless. So if we look at the bless scores, let's look for all mage blesses that would help our mages out. Now that we've determined our play style, which is what I always do first, we're focusing on mages and versatility, more importantly, since we have access to communions. A couple things to consider. These guys have low HP, no protection, but they do have earth buffs on a lot of them, not all of them. We can forge a little bit to protect a few, but that gets expensive. So this guy, same thing, no protection, no protection. He's not a mage, but we can use him for sieging. Good Lord, that's helpful. These are going to be who we spam the most. So this is who I would orient my most of my bless around. These guys, these witch hunters, these guys are going to be how we bring a lot of pain. That's why people always say Marignan brings a lot of heat. 10 HP, no protection. They're vulnerable to rain of stones. They're vulnerable to earthquake. They're vulnerable vulnerable to virtually everything. So we sort of need to orient something around them. One really powerful bless you can always look at under glamour is luck. That always protects people with low HP because if it's going to kill them, 75% chance to avoid taking that damage. But we're again trying to go for a scales build. We're trying to go for an economy win. So we really don't want to be looking at these incarnate only things for the most part. Also, when choosing our chassis, anytime you're looking at the four types of chassis, you have immobiles, you have titans, you have monsters, and then you have little tiny weak humans that nobody ever picks except everybody. I do find it kind of ironic that most players in Dominions choose to play a game where you get to be the power of a god and then you choose the smallest, weakest little dork to run around reading books. We're going to select our chassis. Do we need our chassis to be mobile, first of all? Because we want to know if the Oracle, the Fountain of Blood, statues, if they're all even a possibility for us. So let's eliminate. Let's take a look. Do we have any level three priests to claim thrones? Here it is, the High Inquisitor. <laughs> Notice, they're very old. Do we have a magic site that reduces age? No. Witch Hunters, let's see how close they are. They're going to be old for the most part. We took growth, so not super old, but remember, anytime you have a mage that has fire magic, fire magic lowers the max age of the character, so these guys are all going to be old because level 2 fire magic, I believe, should drop that max age a little bit. There's a bless that we could consider doing because we're not going to depend on these guys. I don't consider a mage a battle mage unless they have at least level 2 in some kind of skill or the ability to pull like a random to level 2. So we're going to consider a bless for mostly the witch hunters and I think unaging would be great just to start that would keep our mages alive so we can amass more of them so let's take a look at the blesses let's just glance down at unaging requires magic scale that goes good with what we've already chosen and only three natures that could be how you'd orient your chassis choice you could go hmm, who has nature in here this person this person this person this person this person I wouldn't do that but it's a good thing to keep in mind is you need nature on your pretender because if you choose a pretender such as this guy you're gonna have to pay 80 points for one point of nature just to be able to even score that and it's going to hurt and you need to get that nature up to three so let's take a look at what else we would look at unaging is good i think that's the best that's right in line with the economy bless but it would be or with the economy dominion score setup but let's look for anything superior morale nah wasteland fire resistance hood but this would be really specific now the advantage to doing a rainbow bless a fire resist shock resist cold resist poison resist is that people would no longer have the counter of dropping foul vapors on us to kill all of our communion that actually is something that i would consider very 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 highly because that's exactly what people like me will do is they'll come in they'll go oh a bunch of human mages no resistance let me drop foul vapors and kill them all that's the fastest way to murder a communion is randomly target random mages with poison and just watch them all die and drop out of the fight they could hit us with hail of stones a little bit of protection would be good a little tempered flesh however if you look at our mages we also all have astral so we can do ethereal on all of these guys if we're really finding out that somebody's targeting us and it reduces the damage from their non-magical stones and that sort of thing pretty well i think what we'll do 
this is what I like to do. How do we get unaging now? Boop, put it on there. Now, even if we change chassis, unaging will stay there. So now we know what we need to earn. Let's take a look at more blessings and see what else we get. Unbearable splendor, flaming weapons, fire shield, heat aura, death explosion. None of these look very good. Inspirational presence, eh. What's our leadership like? Good anyway, good anyway, great actually. So we don't really need to focus on that. Plus I think that's a little overpriced when instead you could just pay for an item and put it on your one or two commanders in a battle that are controlling your troops. Precision would be great for the accuracy of our troops. If our troops don't start with a base of fire resistance and we're looking at a main battle mage that looks like this with communions and fire and turbo communions and reverse communions and everything else, we're gonna be launching fireballs all over the place. So it might actually be good to get ourselves some precision. That might be something we wanna consider as some air for the precision specifically. Reinvig would be good. So earth, now we're looking at some earth we might want. This would be the worst bless of all time for this. Even though it would help your knights out a ton and it would kind of help your mages, I really feel like you'd be overpaying for this, but it is a possibility because it would give you five natural protection. I just feel like you should go one or the other. Stacking and layering defenses is a good thing. Ethereal plus, say, five natural protection on everybody's head would be great. It would prevent a lot, but it wouldn't prevent enough. If an arrow hits you and bypasses Ethereal, it's going to still punch through five protection like it's not there because it's, you know, 15% penetration for a regular arrow and then it's half and 15% for a crossbow. You just, you don't have a chance in the Middle Ages. Spirit Sight would be good. What is the vision on our mages? Nothing special, nothing special, nothing special. We have a precision of nine, which is low. Precision of 10, precision of 10. So we're looking at mediocre precision. Precision and spirit sight would be good because then somebody could easily cripple our entire evocation setup by dropping darkness. All they'd have to do is drop darkness every fight or storm and they would just mangle all of our abilities to annihilate people. So that would be something I would consider very highly. It's starting to look like a rainbow mage would be the best setup for this, right? Far caster is extremely important, but the thing that makes me nervous about precision 10 far casters is as soon as you go to that extra 50% combat spell range, your guys are going to miss by like square upon square. So arcane finesse is very important since we have a lot of astral magic, we'd be able to drop magic penetration on people. That would help. Twist fate would help a little bit with our mages, but only once. This is obviously way too expensive, even though we have the path for it. So it's something to consider because this would make our knights a absolute wrecking force. If we took this as a major bless, even though we're going scales, if we somehow manage to pull this off late game, because early game, we can obviously just have each mage cast ethereal on themselves, body ethereal, and then they can avoid arrows and those random things. Late game, it might be good to have this come through. Something to consider. Undying is huge. That gives an extra two HP to each mage so they can pull off their spells before they die. That's something I would definitely consider if we have extra points. So we are really starting to look Stygian flesh as well. We're really starting to look like a rainbow bless would be very beneficial to this mage bless that we're going for for the witch hunters. Low light vision would be another cheaper option since we already know we're going nature. Going low light vision and resilient might actually be good enough. See, and that's what you need to find is you don't need to find ideal, you need to find good enough. Bark skin, again, same problem as with the natural protection of five up above. It's not going to prevent arrow damage. Your mages are still going to die. They're going to route all sorts of things. Definitely not with old mages. Still affected by darkness, useless. Luck, again, is powerful, but way too expensive, I think. If we went for a super expensive bless, this would be ideal because we can then cast ethereal on our troops so we would have the best of both worlds. I feel like this is just such an investment. All right, so now we kind of know what we're going for. We could, here's a double up. I call this a double up when it benefits our mages, but it also benefits our knights. Blood Surge would make our knights absolute murder balls if we went for the Sacred Knights, and it would also give our knights and our mages reinvigoration when they kill somebody. That's actually something to consider. It's just a lot of points, whereas I could get two points of reinvigoration for a mage every single turn, and that's a mage that doesn't necessarily have to target somebody. And since we're going with a mage bless here, I would avoid this, but this is one to consider if you're making your own Pretender for Marignan, because it benefits both your mages and your knights quite well. You're looking at sort of a rainbow bless, so what would it look like if we did, say, fire resist, shock resist, hold resist? How big of a bless would this cost us? Let's see. Let's find fire, air, water, astral, nature, blood. Let's find a good rainbow chassis. Fire, astral, blood, fire, astral, blood. Let's take a look down here at the standard rainbow chassis. This is a good one, except they split into separate sisters, so it's very hard to cast high level spells if you're planning on actually going high with these ones, so it gets a little difficult. Spoiler alert, Frost Father's usually a pretty good one to choose. Costs 10 per point, starts with two points, 10 per point, a little cheaper, 10 points, but I would rather have the extra 10 points spent on a path that we already want anyway. So let's pick the Frost Father, see what he has. Cold power, don't care, chill, cold resistance. Now you could consider changing this to this to maintain the same dominion just to benefit your Frost Father. I wouldn't, it would screw up the movement speed of your knights and everything else, but it's something to consider. So let's see what happens when we get the pathways we need, just the minimum pathways. There you go, we're at minus 92 points, you can make him dormant and then get ourselves as high as possible, make him imprisoned as a typical rainbow. There you go. We could 
do nine dominion to really spread our scales. We can do this. Problem is getting the minimum paths to cast these or select these blesses is not enough. You obviously have to still score your total bless points. So now what we have to do is we have to look and say, hmm, if I drop this and I raise this, say two more, and I raise, say that two more. Now we're missing one bless point. What if I do that? There we go. There we go. That would give us a very good chassis. This is the one thing I would avoid though. We have no glamour access. So me personally, I just choose to add the glamour in there. Now we have a very wide ranging site searching pretender who can find a lot of things around in terms of magic sites. We have one extra bless point. We've spent all of our points except five. We have seven dominion strengths. So we're going to be pushing our dominion quite well. And for our final bless point, we can choose one of those wonderful undying points or resilient points. We can choose that low light vision, which we already chose spirit sight. So here's what I would evaluate now. This would be what I would look at as my, okay, this is my chassis setup. I'm going to go with the frost father. I'm going to go with this sort of setup. However, I would want to compare the cost analysis between say spirit sight versus low light vision. Let's say dropping a few of my paths down where I can to reduce the bless points that I need like this. And now instead taking an extra scale and no heat, what would you prefer out of those two setups? You have one setup here and we can save this pretender as one. And then we can, by the way, control S is how you save your pretender in the middle without ending and having to go click back in. If we believe there are plenty of like massive darkness casters, people with spirit sight available everywhere, that sort of thing, remove the low light vision, put back in the spirit sight, get ourselves back up here, drop this and raise that. So now we have better sight searching in death, better sight searching in fire, better sight searching in air. But do we really care about the fire? No, because we have these guys to sight search. And these guys have essentially good astral as well. You'll have three astrals running around. You'll have one air, one earth. So now you're looking at earth one is at least covered. We can get an earth booster for one perhaps and get them to sight search for earth gems. That would be something to consider. So we could go get rid of glamour, get up to earth. Now we can produce earth boots. We can put earth boots on the randoms that pop an earth random on a grandmaster and then have them either cast that spell no more to find earth sites out there, which would really jack up our earth economy or at the very least have them walking around site searching. That's a pretty good option because now we're going to get a better gem economy for earth, which is something that we know we want to do since we have earth communions coming. So my initial choice of, Ooh, I want glamor because I don't have it. Not always the smartest choice to make. I make mistakes too, but this is what you're comparing essentially to the other one. And here's what I would do. I would take undying here, resilient or strong Vitae. This would make me feel like my guys could take a, a shot to the head, but you could also consider precision. Precision is something to consider. Precision plus one counts as precision plus two. It's a very, very efficient point. So once you've gotten to this point where you know your two options, you choose, eh, maybe I want precision, but me personally, I would go undying. I like having my mages have at least, you know, 11 HP to get thumped by something. Because if you don't think people are sitting there calculating how to kill your mages in one round, you are mistaken. We are. So there's your other option. We'll save that one. And now you have two chassis for your Marignan setup. So this is how I generally build a pretender. I want my mages, and this also, look at this, this is all a double up build, right? When you look at your sacred troops here, lance with good damage, broadsword with good damage, this is a heavy lance. So you're doing 30 damage on your first hit with these guys, 15 damage, 20 protection, 18 protection, 15 defense skill. These guys already hurt and do a lot of things for you. And now these guys have the ability to ignore displacement and blur. They have the ability to ignore dark darkness. They have the ability to ignore similar things like that. They resist fire, resist shock, resist cold. So there's no easy way to dispatch of them. They're all going to be younger. The knights don't care, but your mages sure do. And that's going to make your mages last a lot longer. Even the research ones sitting around because they're not getting old and dying. Strong blood, if they do get old, now you have disease resistance on top of them, which indirect, well, actually directly increases the survivability of your knights. Because I can't tell you how often it seems like a knight gets hit for one damage from an arrow and pops disease. I have no idea how it happens that often, but it does. So this is something that I would really consider a good out. The other one with low light vision is virtually the same. You're just more vulnerable to darkness, but you get a lot more points back. You get a stronger dominion setup. So you just kind of have to decide what you want your play style to emphasize. Do This would be more of a knight and mage emphasis. The other setup would be more of a dominion emphasis and understand both choices are correct. You can win a game with both of these setups. You could win a game with a terrible setup where you, instead of this chassis, you chose the boar and tried to do the same thing. I just doubt it. It raises your chances. This is a good, I can cover everything 
everything with my mages because how do you target my mages now? You're gonna cast a battlefield, you know, heat from hell spell. Eh, they're not gonna care. You're gonna hit them with that lightning field or whatever that new crazy, yeah, lightning field spell is. No. Cold resist. You're gonna hit them with some auras. No. They're not gonna get fatigued out in the cold or hot climates anymore. So you don't mind this nearly as much. So you're looking at this as how do I keep my mages alive reasonably, not invincible, just reasonably alive. And then if they cast ethereal on themselves, body ethereal on themselves, they'll be fine. And in communions, obviously the body ethereal spreads for them. They're unaging, so they're not going to have as many problems starting. So this is what I would look at. This is what I would look at for that exact setup we had. And then I would take it forward. Next video, we're going to be going more specifically into chassis selection. I'll do probably a little breakdown of chassis selection, but then what I'm going to start doing every time we do one of these videos in this series, I'm going to discuss a topic like chassis selection next video. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to select a chassis, I'm going to build it, and I'm going to run the first couple turns of it or turbo through a bunch of turns and get you to where the strength of that chassis shows up. And I'm going to show you guys an example of how it would affect my play style. Sounds good. I'll see you guys on the next one.